Hi, friends, applauders. My name is Ware Harmon. I'm the executive director of Town Hall Seattle. And um, I always say that it's a pleasure to welcome the person that I'm welcoming, but I don't even have the words to express how I feel about welcoming you to tonight's event with Susan Laurie Parks. As we begin our time together, I want to acknowledge that we gather tonight on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, and particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for their hospitality and for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. Susan Laurie's talk will last, we think, about 45 minutes or so. We say we think because it also includes the presentation of a newly commissioned work, a play called Beginner, to rededicate our great hall. Some of you may know that the very first public event in our building way back in March of 1999 was called Seattle's Favorite Poems. Um, it was mayor, who was the mayor? It wasn't Paul Shell yet. At any rate, the mayor reading, I don't know, uh, Wallace Stevens or something. And the, I, I shouldn't riff. The point is, famous-ish people, local celebrities reading there because suddenly I'm going to get letters about who I said was, yeah. At any rate, um, uh, famous-ish people reading poems that had really moved them. And um, the highlight of the evening or the, the sort of marquee name of the evening was uh, none other than Robert Pinsky, former U.S. Poet Laureate, reading a newly commissioned work um, um, called The Hall that celebrated the opening of Town Hall, and in particular, its great hall, to this community. The piece was taken down for renovation, uh, during our renovation, I should say, but very soon it will return to our walls, along with a copy of tonight's new commission, designed to celebrate our first 20 years, this piece tonight, Beginner, and to set the stage for the next 20. Beginner has been brought to life with the invaluable collaboration of my dear friend Allison Narver and will be performed by Angelina Riley and Aidan Cazzo and by Susan Laurie herself and by every one of you. You each have a role to play and I, not just in the metaphor of like life and stuff but actually in the metaphor of life and stuff that is the play we're about to do. So um, you're all going to have a moment to race across the stage and by race we mean walking slowly, carefully and with purpose and awareness of the fact that you're on a stage. Uh, and if you're uh, house right, which is this side, you'll uh, want to queue up along the wall and run down to here, and you'll come up these stairs, walk to the front of the stage, just, just to the left of the center stage, have a moment with your flower, and then you'll cross off to the other ramp. Meanwhile, the folks who've been queuing up on the right from house left will come up here and have the same thing just to the right here of the center line, and then queue off that way. Um, uh, is that clear as mud? You'll have people who know what they're doing walking at the front of the line. So it'll be really hard to screw it up. But we ask that you, you take your flower to the edge of the stage, you offer your flower to the world, and then cross to the opposite side, taking care of yourself, and uh, you'll get a cue, and uh, that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Oh, oh, when you've had your turn on the stage here, we want you to return to your seats. It's probably easiest that way. You could freestyle it, but that way you don't want to end up in somebody else's lap or something. Um, and then Susan Laurie will have one more suggestion for you before we move on to the Q&A. Capiche? And then when you're finished here, I hope you'll join us downstairs in the auto bar on the first floor of the building for a mixer and for an 8 p.m. concert featuring Susan Laurie Parks um, and Christian Knopka, her band, uh, starting at 8 o'clock tonight in our new forum space. Susan Laurie has traveled clear across the country to be a part of Town Hall's Homecoming Festival, celebrating our 20th anniversary season and, as I mentioned, the reopening of this building. And if it's your first time at Town Hall, uh, welcome. We don't typically give out flowers or make you log extra steps on your device every time, I promise you. Um, but this new town hall has a bar space, as I mentioned, designed for pre and post show gathering, and we hope you'll make use of it. For that matter, that's useful information for longtime town hall friends, too. Don't forget to build a stop at the auto into your plans when you visit this place. The idea is that you'll be able to make new friends and start up conversations with people that um, have just experienced something with you or are about to experience something and share, theoretically, share interests with you. So, um, while we're welcoming people, I also want to welcome any young folks in the audience tonight. This season, we're proud to um, inaugurate a new policy. Um, all tickets to town hall produced programs are free to anyone 22 and under, henceforth. It's cool. And that's with the, that's courtesy Seattle's Office of Arts and Culture. 
Our homecoming calendar is packed with lectures, concerts, artist showcases, pre and post event meetups. Keep an eye out for upcoming events, such as tomorrow's Short Stories Live session featuring work by local writers, curated by Washington poet laureate, laureate Claudia Castro Luna, a showcase of queer performance makers with our festival's artist in residence, Hatlow, a town hall youth takeover featuring concerts by young musicians, rising musicians, I should say, and appearances by Naomi Klein, Samantha Power, Marilyn Robinson. I'm excited about that one. Ibrahim, I'm excited about all of them. But very excited about Marilyn Robinson. Ibram X. Kendi, Jonathan Saffron Four, Chase Jarvis. Visit townhallseattle.org or pick up one of the cool program books on the way out tonight um, and it'll apprise you of everything upcoming. Town Hall's work is only possible through generous sponsorship. Uh, arts and culture here in particular is uh, supported by Four Culture, Arts Fund, National Endowment for the Arts, Seattle's Office of Arts and Culture, KUOW, and the taxpayers of Washington State. Support for our homecoming festival is courtesy Boeing and Alaska Airlines, but greater than all of these mighty corporations and agencies and state actors, good and bad, is the power of our members assembled in the audience tonight. Members are the reason that we're able to offer most programs here for just $5, many of them for free. Um, they're also the reason we're able to make our spaces available to other nonprofits for pennies frankly, really. Uh, no, seriously, they're heavily subsidized against other comparable venues in town. The point is, if you support broad community access to ideas and creativity, we hope you will consider becoming a member. And if membership sounds like too much of a commitment and you don't like commitments, you can also support us by texting a donation to 44321, the words town hall to 44321. Thank you for listening. There ends the um, advertorial. Named Time Magazine's 100 Innovators of the New for the Next Wave, Susan Lori Parks is one of the most acclaimed playwrights in American drama today. She is the first African-American woman to receive the Pulitzer Prize in drama. She's a MacArthur Genius Award recipient and in 2015 was awarded the prestigious Gish Prize for Excellence in the Arts. Other grants and awards include the National Endowment for the Arts, Rockefeller Foundation, Ford Foundation, it's a long list. Parks' project, 365 Days, 365 Plays, where she wrote a play a day for an entire year, was produced um, by over 700 theaters worldwide, including 52 companies right here in Seattle, including Town Hall, uh, creating one of the largest grassroots collaborations in theater history. Her adaptation of Gershwin's Porgy and Bess won the 2012 Tony Award for Best Revival of a Musical. Other works include Imperceptible Mutabilities in the Third Kingdom from 1989, produced locally, I believe, at New City Theater. In fact, I don't believe I know at New City Theater. Um, 1992's The Death of the Last Black Man in the Whole Entire World. 1994's The America Play, Venus from 1996. Top Dog, Underdog from 1999, Father Comes Home, Comes Home from the Wars, Parts 1, 2, and 3, and uh, 2019's White Noise, which won a 2019 Obie Award for Playwriting. <sighs> Please join me in welcoming Susan Laurie Parks. Seattle. Yay. Look at your beautiful flowers. <laughs> oh, so wonderful. Thank you guys for inviting me to celebrate with you today. This is a, a big deal uh, for Seattle, for Seattle Town Hall. It's also a big deal for me because Ware and I have been friends going way back um, to when he uh, was the head of our Seattle hub for 365 Days, 365 Plays, and Seattle really turned out some wonderful theater um, way back then. It was like ee, 2003 or four or five, something like that. Um, but Seattle, I think you guys were the only city to do it every week, and you guys came together and had plays happening in, all over, in parks, in laundromats on tops of buildings, in s empty swimming pools. It was pretty amazing. Um, so I've, I've, I've loved you guys. Loved you guys before, but definitely started loving you guys then. Um, tonight, or this evening, I have a million suggestions for you. A million. <laughs> I know. So a million suggestions. So to get through a million suggestions in the time we have, um, you know, it's, you're going to hear some suggestions. It's, it's going to require that I do something like this. And first I do this. Any of you who are sensitive, you know, ear sensitive. 
<coughs> like that. Because a lot of the suggestions are going to be whizzing by at the speed of sound. Some of the suggestions will be whizzing by at the speed of speech. All of the suggestions you'll be able to incorporate for good use in your daily life. Now also to travel through the world of a million suggestions, I'll be doing some gestures, you know, so just so you know what I'm talking about. So when I do this, it's the text, right? Um, when I do this, it's the sidebar or the access road, or maybe it's a tangent that I've gotten off onto, right? If I do this or this, it's the past. And this would be, of course, Right, yeah, the way back, y'all got it, the way back. This would be the footnote. Um, this is the spirit. Usually if I hear voices, they come from this side. And my husband is sitting right there, Christian, this is great. So this is the spirit. Um, and uh, again, and this I'll, I'll, I'll really work to do before I do each loud noise gesture. So if, you, if I do this, you want, might want to plug your ears a little bit. So I'll be telling you some stories from the book of my life as a writer, because that's pretty much what I do. I write songs, I write plays and movies and TV shows and, and uh, essays and, geez, songs. I play music, we have a band, which we'll be playing some music got later tonight. Um, I'll also, maybe I'll tell you about our son, who's seven going on eight. <laughs> You, yeah, you, you know what that's like. Um, third grade uh, is apparently very exciting uh, these days. Um, after I'm done talking, uh, well, I'll, t I'll talk a lot. We'll see a little uh, beautiful play that I wrote just for Seattle Town Hall. It's called Beginner. And uh, then we'll uh, conclude my lecture and I'll take questions. So if you all have Q&A about my work or your creative process or whatever, I'm here. Um, ask away. But first I'll get started with the question I get asked pretty much a lot, uh, the most. I won the Pulitzer Prize a while ago um, and uh, a lot of people ask me, what's it like being the first African-American woman to win the Pulitzer Prize for drama? And I'm like, it's really great. It's really, really great. Um, it's really great, yeah. But it's also very humbling because, as we all know, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants. We've heard that saying. Um, when we excel, it's because of our own hard work, yes, but it's also because of the hard work of people who came before us, right? People who might have cleared the path that we are walking down. People who might have paved that road that we walk down. So when we... Um, honor this moment, we also honor the people who have come before, and recently people on my mind, you know, Intazaki Shange who passed away recently, Toni Morrison also passed away recently, August Wilson who lived for a good long while in the town of Seattle, um, folks like that helped me be the person and the writer that I am. Um, when our forefathers and our foremothers were dreaming of something better, they were dreaming about us. We, we, we are, as we say in The Tempest, we are such stuff as dreams are made on. Us right here. So, with every step we take, every action we make, we represent, um, as Aristotle said, because right, I'm, I do a lot of drama, as Aristotle said, our characters are the result of our repeated actions. Right? So, in theater and in life, true that. So I started writing, a lot of people wonder when I started writing, and I started writing in the fourth grade. And I'm thinking of my son now, he's in the third grade, and he started, yeah, so I started sort of like, I want to be a writer in the fourth grade. Um, but you can begin doing your thing at any age, right? You don't have to be a little kid to begin something wonderful. Emerson says, do your thing so that I may know you, right? So uh, today is an excellent day to start, as Mahatma Gandhi said, to be that change that you want to see in the world. Today's a great day to begin to be that change, even if you've already achieved something, right? Some of us have you know, been lauded and awarded and have many, many degrees, and we think, ah, no, I've, I've kind of gotten my, my wonderful bit. If, you still, if there's something you still want to do, um, I, I give you permission. <laughs> to do it. Um, I'm always giving myself permission, but even uh, if, you, if you've won prizes, even if you've won the Pulitzer Prize, I have this joke that's 
a joke and then I share it with you. I always ask that when I get on stage to do a lecture, I ask that they provide a chair or a stool, which I, I don't sit in. Um, because I, I don't think it's ever a time to rest on your laurels, you know. Uh, the world is always, the world is waiting for you to do that next wonderful thing. And as I told the people who gathered early today for Watch Me Work, we're counting on you to pull us through. That's why I flew over here from New York. Just to remind myself of that. We're counting on you to pull us through. And I figure if we got the corners, then we got it made. So we're in New York. <laughs> Y'all got the upper, the upper corner, the upper west corner. Um, but we're counting on you to pull us through. If you haven't yet found your thing, how do you find it? Um, you find it by following it, following your gut. You find it by listening in, right? Um, you listen to your own far out ideas. So back to the story of my writing life. Um, my desire to be a writer started when my dad, pretty much when my dad, uh, well, it started with a piano, which doesn't make any sense. But my dad was in Vietnam. He was, uh, for part of his uh, life's work, he was a career army officer, right? He did two tours of duty in Vietnam. And when he came home from Vietnam, from the war, he and my mom had this crazy idea. They had a vision of the American dream, and their vision of the American dream uh, had a soundtrack. And the soundtrack was the sound of their children practicing scales on the piano. Da 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 So they took what little money they had, they didn't have a lot of money, and they bought a baby grand piano, which sat in our various living rooms, because every year we had to move. So we carried, we moved that baby grand piano all around the country, all around in Europe too. I loved playing the piano, but what I loved more than playing the piano was sitting underneath the piano with the family dog. Now, you must remember, this was a time in history when children would go outside and play. They don't so much anymore, but uh, back then, kids would go outside and play, and my brother and sister would be outside playing, and I would be sitting under the piano, and my mother would come looking for me because she didn't hear the sound of me practicing, scales. She'd find me underneath, underneath the piano and she'd say, what are you doing? And I'd say, I'm writing my novel. <laughs> I had a notebook and I was writing my novel. Now, again, you know, it was fourth grade. I had read two novels, Harriet the Spy, which is an amazing novel, Hotel for Dogs, which is also an amazing novel, which is getting some traction again uh, recently. Um, our son loves the novel Hotel for Dogs. And I had read At, a novel, At, which means that you'd pick up the illustrated classics off your parent's shelf, you know, illustrated Don Quixote, and I read the captions underneath the drawings. So I had, you know, two-ish novels under my belt. For Valentine's Day, my parents had given me the James Baldwin uh, book, The Fire Next Time, uh, for Valentine's Day. <laughs> I, you know, I was like, it's a novel about fire. You know, I didn't have, I had no idea what it was about. But I look on the back of the book a lot and study his face, the look on his face. Uh, still, I figured, I'd read two plus novels. I was gonna be a writer. I was gonna write a novel too, which brings us finally to suggestion number one. Suggestion number one, entertain all your far out ideas. Entertain all your far out ideas. Invite them in. Sit them down at your table, give them some delicious food and drink, put on some music, light some candles, invite them to bring their friends over. Invite your far out ideas to take root in your life. Invite them to bloom. Now what's an example of a far out idea for my life? 365 days, 365 plays is a far out idea. I just said, I'm gonna write a play a day for a whole year. Then I'm gonna go around the country and invite people to do them. We won't make any money, but we'll have fun. 
a far right idea. Top dog, underdog was also a far right idea. Um, pretty much everything I've ever written is a far right idea, is a result of a far right idea. So most of the time your far out ideas come to you, right? And they are met with this. Oh, it's not practical. I don't know, I'm too old. What will the neighbors think? My kids will laugh at me. I'm not old enough. Like that. So you're, you're, they're met with this kind of thing. And I know because then they come to me. And I'm like, sure, I'll do it. Like that. So um, to entertain all your fart ideas. And, and, uh, <laughs> uh, but I started writing in the fourth grade. After that, after I started writing in the fourth grade, what did I do? I kept up with it, right? I continued. And just because I'm standing up here talking this evening doesn't mean that the trip hasn't been, like my son says, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Um, the journey is blessed, of course, but not without stress. It takes tenacity, resilience. I was in high school a long time ago, and I took AP English class. I think they still have AP English classes. Do they still do that? Um, advanced placement English, right? So I wrote wonderful essays, but I was a lousy speller. Now, how that, can that be a problem? Those of you who don't remember, back in the days of time long lost, before everybody had a personal computer, before Microsoft took over the city, um, <laughs> they had such things like, uh, it was called BSC. It was a time of, uh, of history called BSC which means before spell check. And those of us who were not naturally gifted spellers um, were, uh, were doomed, <laughs> were doomed. Um, my English teacher in high school would tell me, sound it out, sound it out. That was how they told us to spell. Didn't work, doesn't work in English to sound out uh, words. Every week, my AP English teacher, because back then, if you were a good speller, you were considered to be intelligent. And if you were a poor speller, you were considered to be not so bright. So she wanted to test us all every week. She'd give us a list of words on Monday, and by Friday, we'd have a, to, you know, we'd have a test. And I'd study really hard. And the test day would come around. And Friday starts with F for a reason, because I'd... <laughs> So the whole academic year of this, this was a whole year's worth of pain and suffering. And finally, you know, I, I kept my grades up in other classes, so I managed to get into college, Mount Holyoke College. Luckily, they accepted me. Are someone raised? Yay, right? It's, it's one of the best, uh, well, don't want to be biased or anything, but it's kind of the best college in the country. Um, <laughs> Just saying, but it's, a, it's, an amazing, it's an amazing place. And I went to my high school English teacher and for the debriefing, you know, the thing that they, ta they have to give you a talk before you go out into the world. And she said, oh, oh, she, oh that's another thing about her. She had an, um, an overbite. So she talked like this. And she said, well, Miss Parks, Congratulations on getting into Mount Holyoke College. What are you intending on studying? And I said, well, I'm going to be a writer. And she said, well, that's very interesting. And she took out her grade book, this huge ledger, and she found my name, the dust floating up to the ceiling. She found my name. And she read across my grades for those, all those failed spelling tests. And if my dreams and hopes had been a little red balloon, she said, well, Miss Parks, you shouldn't major in English and you should not be a writer because you're a very poor speller. And I heard what she said, and my response, I said, yes, ma'am. Because, you see, I was raised, uh, my dad was in the Army, 
And we were brought up to say, yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, and yes, sir, and no, sir. You know, we were raised like that. Um, I wasn't too upset. I had a backup plan. I was really good in science. And so I figured I was just going to be the first black woman in space which Dr. Mae Jemson did it instead, which was really good because I would have been totally bad at it. But I went to college and I became a chemistry major, which brings us to suggestion number two. Sometimes a well-meaning person who you respect and who wants you to succeed gives you some advice, it's coming out of their mouth, that does not jive with what's going on inside you. You respect them, they like you, they're talking to you, it doesn't make sense. And when that happens, just simply say no thank you to their advice. Um, I hadn't heard of that suggestion back then because that was in you know, my past and here I am now. So I went to college and I took a lot of science courses. They were cool, I spent hours in the lab. I wore a white lab coat and rubber gloves and a rubber apron and those goggles and we stood there mixing all kinds of really interesting chemicals not to diss science majors at all, but I felt, I'm like, I'm dying. This is what it feels like to be dead. Um, I had to take a science class, I had to take a, an English class because they make you take English at Mount Holyoke. You must be well-rounded. So I had to go into the English class, and of course I didn't want to because I'd been told I was lousy at it, and so I had developed a, a justified, a hatred of literature, and I sat in class like this, and we read books like mm -hmm, To the Lighthouse. Has anybody read Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse? You have, you've read it, C you've read it. Can you tell me what it's about? <laughs> can you explain it to me? You can, you can, huh, you're doing your jet with gestures. Hmm. It's a what, what? Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, now there, see, I could have used that 87 years ago when I was in college. Difficult to communicate. I can only repeat parts of the novel. It will be fine. It won't be fine. Will we go to the lighthouse? I don't know. Mrs. Ramsey dies in parentheses. Someone is knitting. Lily Briscoe paints a, a something or other. She puts a shape in the right place. They go to the lighthouse. They give the socks to the lighthouse keeper's boy. The end. <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't know. And like I said, I can only repeat lines from the novel. I, can, I haven't, I don't think I've digested it. I don't think I wrote a good paper on it. It certainly wasn't spelled well, that I know. But I fell in love with that novel. Don't know why. I absolutely fell in love with that novel. I felt like I read that novel that I couldn't understand and I couldn't be eloquent about, but I felt like, you know, flowers, flowers that turn their faces to the sun, you know, yeah, you know, heliotropism. I felt like I had turned back to the thing that I love. You know, I had turned back, I, Virginia Woolf, I would say, helped me remember myself, remember myself, put my limbs, my body, myself back together. So there I was in college, I'd fallen back in love with literature, and so that little dream of being a writer started to grow again. Maybe I could try, I don't know. So what I did is I decided, well, I'm just gonna take some more English classes. I'm gonna be a writer, I said one day to myself. <laughs> no one heard me. That's the same thing I do now, 87 years later. I decide to be a writer every single day. I wake up in the morning, sometimes I say it aloud, sometimes I say it silently to myself while I'm meditating. I'm gonna be a writer today. And it takes that kind of commitment in my life to be a writer. Um, you know, after a certain number of years, we figure, hey, come on, you've been doing it for so long, don't you just coast? There's no coasting in life. There's no cruise control. You know, it's a relationship. Just because you get married or have someone who says, I love you, you gotta love that person every day, 
right? You got to make that love anew every day. You have to commit yourself to the thing you love, whether it's a, whether you're a parent or a dentist or a chemist or a doctor or a pilot or an accountant or whatever, you know, um, you have to take your vows and renew your vows every day. So being a writer like that, it's, um, it's, it's a continual daily practice of saying, yes, yes, I'll try. I'll do my best. Um, and I try every single day. I was telling the, the folks in Watch Me Work, even if it's just for five minutes of writing, you know, now, we, you know, typewriter or computer, you know, even if it's not good, you know, I was thinking the other week to some of my students um, back in New York, and whether or not you believe in God or what you want to call the spirit, but they say there's a phrase, God is good, you know, this is a sidebar, by the way. God is good. They don't say God is perfect, right? So what are we trying to be perfect for? Just be good, you know? In our house, we say, my husband's from Germany, we say good genug, good genug, good enough, you know? Just try something, try something. So um, that's what I started doing way back in college. And I was not, not the best writer in any of my writing classes, ever. Um, but uh, still, wonderful things started to happen. And one is I didn't have to take any more chemistry classes, which I thought was really good. I would have blown up something. Um, I got to spend a lot of time writing and reading, which I loved. And I, got, I heard when that there was a very famous, wonderful writer who was going to be teaching writing uh, at a college down the road. From, from Mount Holyoke College. And I was, it was suggested that I apply to his class. And it was James Baldwin. He was, he was, he was, he was, you know, wanted to hang out in the Pioneer Valley. Take a break from living in France. Hang out in the Pioneer Valley and teach a creative writing class. He told us that he had never taught a creative writing class before which is the uh, spoiler alert to my application process, because I was one of the 15 students who got in. 15 of us at a library table at Hampshire College right down the road. And I remember that first. Now remember, Valentine's Day, 10 years before, when I was in fourth grade, my parents gave me this book, The Fire Next Time. All I knew of James Baldwin, I knew, still hadn't read the book. I don't think. But I had been studying his face on the dust jacket. And so I was like, okay, this is amazing. He's going to come in. He's going to be huge. He's going to fill the whole doorway. And, and, and he came in, and he was, he's very slight, of, very finely built. He's about this tall, was about this tall. Um, fine limbs, very beautiful. A head, he looked like a head, like a Q-tip swab, like an alien eyes that could see through your best bullshit. And he sat at the head of the table and conducted class every Monday. After class, each week, he would invite us for drinks. You know, and it wasn't in a weird way. It was, he liked to socialize. And he would say, come to the local bar or whatever it was back then and ha have drinks with Jimmy. Jimmy. I never called him Jimmy. I always called him Mr. Baldwin. I never went for drinks. I was like 18, I don't know, I was like, I'm not going to drink alcohol with Mr. Baldwin. <laughs> but, you know, it, uh, it, was, it was a beautiful thing. He was very generous, very kind. When it was my turn, so it was a short story writing class, if you can imagine. So there we are, 15 people, these are bright, brilliant, young writers from the valley. There were three from UMass, three from Smith, three from Amherst, three from Hampshire, and three from Mount Holyoke. These are cool, the cool people. They had all written beautiful short stories. And I'd written some short stories, and I thought that my short stories would be better if I performed them in class. So I got in the habit when it was my turn, which happened every, I don't know, three or four weeks or so, I would stand up at the library table and read my short stories aloud and kind of act them out. And this went on all semester. Nobody in the class said, you're crazy, stop doing that. Nobody said that. Um, I was really into it. I thought that it made the story sound better. 
Uh, after one class, uh, Mr. Baldwin took me aside and he said, um, Miss Parks, have you ever thought about writing for the theater? <laughs> now, I gotta say, sidebar, like, I didn't, I didn't like the theater. <laughs> mm, no, no. See, theater, like to my, I mean, I, I, I love novels and poetry. And I mean, Shakespeare, but Shakespeare wasn't theater, right? Shakespeare was Shakespeare. Yeah, right. Okay. But I would look at the theater people, you know, the people who are theater majors. I can still see them in my mind's eye across the green. They're gallivanting. <laughs> but they are. They're always like, having a good time, wearing like funny hats. And talking, and I mean, they were all American, right? It was an American school. They're all saying, darling, 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 like that. I'm like, uh-uh, I'm not one of those people. Um, I'm a writer, okay? But anyway, uh, yeah, so suggestion number two was just say no to, to advice that doesn't jive with you. And suggestion number three is sometimes someone, it's very tricky, sometimes someone you respect who really thinks a lot about you and really wants you to succeed gives you some advice that actually does jive with something that's going on inside you. And when that happens, you take their advice, which is what I did. And I started writing my very first play on the bus ride home from class scrawling it in my notebook, not knowing what I was doing, but figuring, hey, you know, I'll give it a go. Yeah, Mr. Baldwin suggested I try playwriting, and that's still what I'm doing today, trying playwriting. It's the same activity. Um, sidebar, there's a wonderful uh, teacher. I do a lot of yoga. If we want to talk about yoga, we can in the Q&A. But there's a wonderful teacher who... Uh, says, uh, his name is Adil Pakivala, who says, you don't want to spend enormous amounts of energy climbing the ladder of success only to find that you've propped your ladder up against the wrong wall. And we ask ourselves, how do we know what's the right wall? That looks like the right wall. It's stained glass. It's beautiful. That could be the wall. Or, oh, gee, no, maybe it's that one. How do we know which wall is the right wall, right? Spend more time listening to your own voice. Thanks. <laughs> Suggestion number 1,620. <laughs> Told you. Practice listening. Uh, listen to what they call that small, still voice within. Tune into your own guts. And I mentioned practice listening because people are always asking where I get my ideas from. And of course, I'm out in the world all the time and get a lot of ideas from, from being in the world and being awake in the world. I also get a lot of ideas from listening in to my own guts, that inner listening. Like William Faulkner said, I listen to the voices. Um, that's the kind of listening I'm, I'm talking about. Um, so here's another, oh, here's an example, yeah, of, of listen, listening to the far-out ideas, and tonight I'll sing a song that I wrote for this play. But, um, for example, I was in a canoe. I was out in Nantucket. I'm not sure which is east or west, but I'm going to pretend it's over there. Oh, that way? The, west, the east is that way? Awesome. So Nantucket, right? You can imagine. It's like this way, this way, this way. Nantucket. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. In a canoe, in a canoe. So I'm, in Nan I'm out in Nantucket in a canoe with a friend paddling in the front and I'm paddling in the back and I say out loud to no one, I'm gonna write a play uh, that's gonna be a riff on the scarlet letter. I'm gonna call it fucking A. Ha, 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 ha. Like that. Far an idea coming in. And then I go, huh, well, so we, we continued roaring. My friend did not laugh. <laughs> it didn't stop me. Row, row, row. You get back to the shore and you're, you know, you're walking in the mud. And I'm thinking, that could be kind of cool, right? So what do I have to do now? Game plan, right? What do I have to do to write a riff on the scarlet letter called fucking A? I have to read the scarlet letter. <laughs> 
yeah. So I did that, and then I then I went ahead and uh, then I went ahead and wrote wrote the the play, The Scarlet Letter, which is a, a beautiful. Came out, came out really well. And the, the wonderful thing about it is that I started writing the Scarlet, uh, the fucking A, and it was so hard to write that, um, long story short, it turned into two plays. One is called In the Blood, and one is called The Scarlet Letter. So I actually got two plays out of that, that far out idea. Um, here's another suggestion. Suggestion number 1,621. Make sure that your fear does not erode your faith. Make sure that your fear does not erode your faith. Suggestion number 1,622, uh, mantras, if you heard the word mantras, right? I was in a yoga class the other week and they were talking about how mantras are mind vaccines. Uh, not if you're an anti-vaxxer, just go with it for just a minute. Because um, it doesn't involve you know, anything uh, but just thoughts mind vaccines, and there are a lot of wonderful mind vaccines uh, that I'll talk about uh, a little bit later. But question, does, uh, does anyone here have a meditation practice? Anybody? One, two, three, 12, 20, good, nice. Well done, well done. Um, I always, everywhere I go, every time I talk to folks, I encourage us all to either renew or celebrate or start begin our meditation practice. Um, like I was telling the folks in Watch Me Work, it's, you can go to a fancy place and give them a lot of money and they'll give you a mantra and get you started if that's the way you'd like to go. That's your choice. You can also just get a timer, a simple kitchen timer. And first thing in the morning, instead of checking your news feed, no, no, you can check in with this news feed which is sitting quietly, either in a chair or on the floor if you're into that kind of thing, right? Setting the timer to maybe 10 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, and just breathing in and out. Thoughts come and go. Our minds are, are very busy places. Just breathe in and out. If you need a mantra, just the sound of your breath is the mantra that you were given at birth. You can use that. Or if you want to say something like, thank you, that's a nice one, you know? Um, what meditation does, what it's done for me is it allows me to think more clearly and to recover more quickly from the dumb stuff, that's a <laughs> word choice, the, uh, the, the stuff uh, that's going on in the world sometimes that makes me wanna holler, I holler and then I can recover and just, and just keep on with, with, my, uh, with my day and be grateful for the things that are beautiful instead of obsessing on the things that are not. Um, and this and meditation is not a substitute for, for, for political action. We know that too. So we're not just gonna sit on our cushions. We're gonna do like folks back in the day did. You know, you pray with your feet by walking and, and, and being active. Um, great. Suggestion number 1,734, your breath is your divine voice. Take some time every day to listen to it, even if you've only got 30 seconds a day. Maybe that's all the time you need. Okay, my yoga teacher says, when you don't feel like you have any time, that's exactly when you should meditate. Okay, so if you've got a cramped day and we're all very busy, but see if you can take some time. Uh, meditation is a built-in mindfulness app. Oh, that's right. I did a talk mm, six, eight months ago to, at USAFA. Does anyone know what USAFA is? The United States Air Force Academy, where if you've ever want to hear yes ma'am and yes ma'am in a loud, thunderous voice, you go to USAFA and stand in front of them and they snap to attention like you've never seen. And why was I at the Air Force Academy? Because they invited me to talk with them and say hi. Because they believe that they need to learn from lots of different kinds of people doing lots of different kinds of things. And some of my friends heard I was going and they're like, you gotta be kidding. And I'm like, no, I'm going. Because these kids wanted me to talk with them. But I tried to talk with them about meditation. And so I started calling it 
a built-in mindfulness app to combat stress. And we had really beautiful conversations about about, about meditation. So, a sidebar tangent, neuroplasticity, which most of you know what that is, developing your brain. We're all told that we're born, you know, at a certain point in our lives, we're rigid and fixed, you know? Like by the time you're, I don't know what people say, eight or 10 or 15 or 21 or something. That's it. But things like meditation help you stay flexible in your mind. And one thing we need to get through these difficult days is maximum flexibility, right? That's another thing I came all the way here to remind us all about. Um, oh, back to my story. So my teacher, James Baldwin, because I believe, I, I really feel like he is my teacher. I didn't go to grad school after I graduated from college. I figured I'd had a wonderful experience with a brilliant teacher. Uh, my teacher, James Baldwin, steered me toward playwriting, which was great. He taught me also how to conduct myself in the presence of the Spirit. How to conduct myself in the presence of the Spirit. Now, what does that mean? You treat the Spirit as an honored guest, right? Um, you're welcoming to all your forward ideas. That's how you conduct yourself in the presence of the Spirit. And you're respectful to the Spirit as you would be respectful in the presence of a powerful volcano, which you guys have here. That way? That way. So, that way. They're all around. Thank you. <laughs> you guys have a lot of volcanoes here, so you know what that's like. Um, and you're attentive to the Spirit as you would be attentive to your sweetheart, to your lover. Um, how to conduct yourself in the presence of the Spirit. And he taught me that every day, every one of us, we are always in the presence of the Spirit. Um, and yeah, I had to remind the Air Force students, and I have to remind myself that the flowers don't want us to hate anybody. And the trees don't want us to hurt anybody. And the water says, if you listen to the water, it's saying a lot of things. But the water is saying, come on in, everybody. And the sun shines for everybody. If we could listen to that more. So fast forward really fast. I graduated from college. I moved to London for a while because I thought this theater thing, they have a lot of theater in London. Thought I'd go over there and see some theater. Came back to New York City, did not go to grad school. Did odd jobs in New York City took a typing course. I, I, not only was I a lousy speller, I was a lousy typist. So I had to take a typing course at the Betty Owen Secretarial College, where I learned how to type very fast. And I had this kilt, um, because that was the fashion back 100 years ago for young women at Mount Holyoke. We wore kilts. You wore a kilt, right? I mean, they were cute, you know? So I had this kilt, which was the only like, nice thing in my closet. And I would go to work every day in this red kilt. Of course, I'd have to tie my hair back so that I would look presentable, as that was the code word at the temp agency where I worked. So you had to tie your hair back, wear a kilt, and uh, work all day for lawyers who would yell at you. Hurry up! I mean, what was so important? Who knows? Anyway, hurry! You're not fast enough! <laughs> like that. That was the day. And then in the evening, I'd go to the East Village, which was cool. And all my friends who hung out there, they were all poets and stuff. And they were cool, and they were all black, and they wore, you know, sunglasses 24-7, and they drank absinthe or whatever, and smoked unfiltered cigarettes, and they looked at me and they were like, oh, you're never gonna be an artist. You're not cool. <laughs> Suggestion number 6,393, don't worry about being cool. Being cool is overrated, and besides, you'll miss all the fun. I'm saying that to you because you look like you're a young person. Remember that. Don't worry about being cool. That's, I'm gonna use an adult word. Cool is bullshit. <laughs> right? You, everything you have, everything you need, you have. 
And uh, we tell my son this all the time. We, it, we, we, we think advertising makes us think that we have to go out and buy that special something to make us wonderful. It's a sham. You have it inside already. You know, I have to remind myself about that all the time, but we have, we, we have everything we need, okay, inside already. Moved to New York City. I got my first big break in the business. I self-produced my own play. So that's, you know, how I got my first big break. Um, I was hanging out, I would write, so I work during the day for the lawyers, hang out with the poets until late at night, then go home and write and get up in the morning and do it all over again. And I had this play that I'd written and I was hanging out at night in the East Village in a bar called the Gas Station. And we walked by there the other week. It's not there anymore. They tore it, they tore it down. They just put up a high rise or something. But it was a gas station. It was a bar that used to be a gas station. And it had no furniture. It had one green couch on which all kinds of things happened. And it had lights, it had Christmas lights. That was the only lighting it had. And I was sitting on the couch one night and the bartender slash owner slash artist in residence, Osvaldo from Argentina, I said, Osvaldo, you know, I wanna do a play here. And he said, okay, we've never done plays here, but um, if I'll go out and buy some chairs and you could maybe buy some lights? And I said, got it. It was my first show. Great. So I went out, I took my money, my hard-earned temp word processing money, and I bought a whole bunch of lights back then when there was a hardware store in every corner. And you could go into the hardware store and you could buy those clip lights, you know. So I bought a whole bunch of those. And then I got yards and yards of yellow industrial strength extension cords and I went into the bar and I clipped up these lights, put light bulbs in them, of course, and then I connected them all with yellow extension cords and they met in the back of the stage and I put like a, a piece of furniture in the back of the stage. You couldn't see because I hid behind the piece of furniture because we had lighting cues. And so I hid behind the piece of furniture, and while the actors were on stage doing my play, I was hiding behind a piece of furniture, and lights up was this, and lights down was this. And so I was doing this <laughs> for like an hour and a half. It was beautiful. It was, um, it, it, let's see, we, we, we ran for three days, which was the standard uh, run for an awful, 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 off-Broadway play. Um, some people came, uh, let's see, uh, the bar owner, Osvaldo, came. And my mom and my dad and my sister and the homeless man who lived outside. Yeah, that was kind of it. Um, it was cold outside, so he came inside to keep warm. I had arrived. I was so proud of myself because I had a play on in New York City. And I feel always the same way now, like, yay. You know, I wasn't, I tell my students, like, they sit around and wait for, I don't know who, Steven Spielberg or whomever, <laughs> whomever, Ryan Coogler to call them up and invite them on some wonderful artistic adventure. And I just remind them that you can, uh, suggestion number 7,777, 7, as my dad says, you make your luck. You make your luck. And um, so I started writing plays. I've continued after that big break, you know, came more of the same. Um, and then some slightly bigger productions, uh, Venus in the Blood, screenplays for Spike Lee, like Girl Six, working for Oprah, writing a novel the film adaptation of Native Son that was just on HBO. I'm fast forwarding. Um, but it's always been just the daily activity of showing up at my writing desk, you know? I think of the awards and prizes that we accumulate, and the very first one I ever got was in first grade. We were in Texas in first grade, and I got an award for perfect attendance. 
And it was not lost on me, even as a, what, a six-year-older, that the key was just to show up. <laughs> and I do the same, do the same, same, same. Um, oh, the suggestions are out of order. Suggestion number 88, courage is contagious. Suggestion number 81, if you feel like you're getting breadcrumbs, that might be tough, but breadcrumbs are enough to get you home. Suggestion number, oh, these five suggestions from the civil rights movement. Remember I taught, I was talking about the mind vaccines, these mantras from the civil rights movement. Suggestion number nine, each one teach one. Suggestion number 12, lift others as you climb. Suggestion number 63, is eyes on the prize. Suggestion number 144, ain't nobody gonna turn me around. And my favorite one, suggestion number 953, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. And you know if it worked for folks back in the day, it can work for us today. Suggestion number 9,260, 9, as Pema Chodron said, she's a wonderful Buddhist nun. You guys know Pema Chodron, right? She's pretty, pretty cool. Um, I love hearing her lecture, and she always reminds us to smile at your fear. Smile at your fear, just as a spiritual exercise, right? Suggestion number 68 from Eleanor Roosevelt, which I quoted today in Watch Me Work earlier today. You must do the thing that you think you cannot do. Eleanor Roosevelt, who we remember, allowed Marian Anderson to sing, made it possible for Marian Anderson, Marian Anderson to sing at the Lincoln Memorial because the Daughters of the American Revolution would not let Marian Anderson sing in their hall. You must do the thing that you think you cannot do. And you know what that moment is when you think, I can't do that, when you clinch up. That's exactly where maybe you need to try. Um, I wrote Top Dog Underdog. I started it in 1999 on the 6th of January, and I finished on the 9th of January. It was fast to write, um, and I don't trip on that. I mention it because it reminds me of suggestion number eight, which is don't trip on something because it just might trip you up. And if we want to talk about Top Dog Underdog, we can do that more in the Q&A. A lot of people ask me about that. But what happens was I wrote it very quickly, then I called up my friend Bonnie Metzger, who was a producer at the Public Theater, and I said, Bonnie, I just wrote a new play. It just happened. <laughs> Can I have a reading of it? She said, sure. The public theater was willing to do it, to produce the play eventually. And then finally it found its way after 9-11, which was devastating to New York. But we got back on our feet. The play found its way to Broadway. And we opened on a Sunday night. And the next day, uh, it was a wonderful opening, and the next day, they announced the Pulitzer Prizes, and I had won. And the sound in my head was Whoa! Everything either slowed down or sped up. I'm still not sure. But I think it was the sound of all these, this information passing. Suggestion number five, be a theater of one. Uh, people ask me a lot of times, people ask me, what are we supposed to do? Or what are some of the things that we can do in times like these? Difficult times. Number one, you know, know what we always know, right? Times have been difficult for a long time. They didn't start recently. They've been difficult for a long time. Um, but what can we do in times like these? And I, one of my suggestions, one thing I try to do is be a theater of one. Be a theater of one. So every day when you wake up and get out of bed, a play starts and you are the main actor in the play and you are going to set an example for behavior. 
because if anything, we are learning from each other constantly. We're constantly learning how to behave by watching each other and listening to each other. Regardless of who you voted for, underneath all the bullshit, the hatred and fear, is my hope that we have access to our, the angels of our better nature. That's so qualified, you can hear that. It's almost like I'm speaking German. I hope that we have access to the angels of our better nature. But what you can do out there is you can be a theater of one. Every day you put on a play, you're the star of the show. The world is your stage and you're gonna show us how to be beautiful. And oftentimes it's, it's you're tested, you know, things don't work out your way, somebody cuts you off in traffic, but you're gonna show, you're gonna be that example. Um, you can make a gesture in the direction of the good. <laughs> Suggestion number 888,888, practice radical inclusion, not just inclusion like this, for your friends, right? But radical inclusion, I'll do it this way. Radical inclusion, you see the, the shoulder joint, it's slightly beyond your shoulder joint. It's like this. And this gesture can be reserved for people who are not like us. It's a spiritual practice. You can practice it, you can start practicing it in front of, say, the television or the computer screen. It might be painful. You might not like it, but it's for you. It's not for them, whoever you, however you define them, right? It's something for you. Um, moving slightly outside your comfort zone and seeing yourself in the other. I know it's like, there's nothing that, there, we're so far, man, they're nothing like me. I disagree, I disagree. We are more like each other than we'd like to believe. All of us. Um. <laughs> Suggestion number 475. Oh, watch me work. So that's something we did it this afternoon uh, downstairs in the library space, I think it was called. It's a lot of fun. I also do it live online, it's totally free, and it's about your work. So if ever you have a question that you'd like to ask me about your work, you can go on live, I live stream. It's on Mondays, howl round, I do it live in the lobby of the public theater, and we live stream, so you can tweet in and talk to me, and um, really, really, really uh, a fun thing to do, and it helps you get your work done. Suggestion number 340,885, oh. This is a hard one. When in doubt, say thank you. Yeah, see, that's kind of a dicey one. Suggestion number 45, take the stairs. Suggestion number 8,944, oh, keep the drama on the stage. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. We have a song in my house, uh, we don't need no unnecessary drama. So we do that a lot. So keep the drama on the stage. Suggestion number 99, when you get an award, Regardless of the specifics of the award, know that you've been called upon to increase the amount of kindness and compassion in the world. And lots of folks think that getting an award gives them license to be unkind. You know, I'm better than you now, because I got this, this thing, this, right? Actually, um, they need to read the fine print on the award uh, because the opposite is true. When you've been summoned to stand before others, you've been summoned, right? You've been summoned to represent the human race. Um, I won lots of prizes, and if you've made it this far, you've been prized. You are a prize. If you've made it this far in your life, you're extremely lucky, right? And all of us who have been given those, this kind of prize, um, are here to, to spread the love and increase the peace, right? Suggestion number 12,293. Oh, you are the ambassadors of your race. My parents used to say that to me when I was a child. You are the ambassadors of your race because where we lived, 
we were like in Germany, and that was before there were a lot of, you know, there was no MTV or anything, and there wasn't a lot, a lot of integration there. But we walk in places and people would stare at us. We're in Vermont. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I knew you're are you from Vermont? The Champlain Valley Fair in the early 1970s, I went uh, with some friends and people surrounded me and began to pet me. Vermont. I stayed very still. <laughs> and lived to tell the tale. But you are the ambassadors of your race, um, which means that these days it means you are the ambassadors of the human race. Yeah, and by bringing it, you know, bring something wonderful, right? Suggestion number 555,512 is always realize the value of kindness. And this next suggestion, suggestion 555,513 is a new play called Beginner. Now the action of this play starts right here, right now. Where do I begin? Why are you asking? Just curious. All of a sudden you're just curious? I've, I've been curious for a long time, but I never thought the question that I asked you was a question one should ask, really, because it's a question that has an answer that could, oh, I don't know, um, start a fight, or a party, or a parade, or a wedding, or a fissure or a series, or a portal, or a race. A race? You heard me. Just then, hundreds of people, hundreds of people just like you, race across the stage. It's optional, of course. Don't feel pressured. You're part of this whether you cross the stage or not. It's as if every single person in Seattle, Washington, also known as the Emerald City. Every single person, and of course, everywhere in the world too, right? We're at this very moment. Oh, this is beautiful. I'm gonna pause from reading the stage directions just to watch. This is absolutely gorgeous. Oh, see? Every single person from everywhere, right at this very moment, is racing out of doors or racing to the gym. You can keep your flowers if you want. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't feel like you can hold on to them, that's right. Or they're racing as part of a sport, or maybe they're late for a bus, or they're racing to catch a taxi, or they're racing to catch a boat, or a plane, or maybe they're racing to try to cross a river, maybe they're racing to change their mind. Oh, thank you. Hi. They're racing and they're running, maybe trying to cross a river or a border or a sea. Everybody racing and running. Everybody running on something or hi or toward something they're running from something and also right everybody is running something yeah we're all running something we're all running something aren't we and we're all on some kind of path we're all on some kind of path. You, 
can have them back after. Boom. Thanks, brother. And we're all, we're not only on some kind of path, but as I see you up close, everybody, you guys are pretty. You guys are really nice to, I mean, I don't mean, I don't mean that in an inappropriate way. I mean it in a kind of just a, like you guys are nice to look at. <laughs> so thank you for being attractive. <laughs> Thank you for showing up. Oh, thanks. Thank you for being so wonderful. Thank you for participating. I have never cried giving a speech like this, but I think I just might. I'm trying not to. I want to be professional. But your presence does move one to tears, Seattle. Is that why it rains here so much? <laughs> you guys are so moving. Thank you. Beautiful people. Oh dear, I still have to read the stage directions. Oh yeah, and every person is carrying a flower. Now what kind of flower? Well, if we're lucky, that's going to be the flower of our own choosing. And the people racing, they know that from this very moment, when you see these people racing across the stage, I want you to know from this moment, things for you are going to be better. Because we're all on the road to recovery and you don't have to run. Because you know, you're already there. The action of this play takes place on this stage. And it also takes place in the stage in the unused venue, the stage inside your head, right? And the action of this play takes place over and over and over and over and over again, which means that it's a forever play. Oh, am I getting off the subject? Am I getting off the path? No, not at all. Yay. Uh, back to our play. <laughs> well done. The human race! Exactly. You've got something to teach me. I can smell it. Go on. Okay, right. Um, well, okay. Uh, let's see. Um, we know... We know that there is no I in team. Mm hmm But did you know there is a me in enemy? Good job. Thank you. Did you, did you come all this way to learn that? No. But you came all this way to tell it to me. Okay. How do you do that? Do what? Get under the surface of me. Get inside my head. You opened the door and let me in. You flew me into town and opened the door and let me in, so here I am. I'm here. And I'm in your head deeply curled up in there, giving you a healing hug. Mm. Thank you. That's, that's what I do, pretty much. It's like the common thread running through my output. Wow. Deep. What was your question? Which one? The one up there at the top of the page, or back there in the past. The question you had about where do I begin? I have never, ever told an actor how to say a line, but it would be really great if you could say it just like you did earlier, you know, at the top of the play. Where do I begin? Exactly. Where do I end? Good questions. And what about the others? What others? Where? Over there? 
Oh, they're you. They don't look like me. No? Not at all. They, they're all, mmm, and I'm all, yeah, and they've got scrunch, or I've got herk, and I'm all, wow, wow, and they're all, woo, woo. Huh, there you, there you are, right here, right there, and over there, too. Mm, couldn't be. It's true. So, everything is part of everything? One thing expressing itself in infinite variety? Bingo. Should I ask what else is there? No, don't ask. Um, and that's the whole game of life in one moment. Yep. Should we sing a song? Let's. Okay. Now that you guys have proven yourself so brilliantly, we're gonna ask you to do a little group singing, which is part of a song that I wrote for you guys. I'm, we're gonna sing it tonight with the band, but right now we're gonna try to sing the chorus part, okay? Now I'll sing it for you and then we'll try. We're going around and around and around and around and around and around again. We're going around and around and around and around. We're going around and around and around and around and around and around again. We're going around and around and around and around. We're going around and around and around and around and around and around again. We're going around and around. And around and around we're going around and around and around and around and around and around and around we're going around and around and around and around we're going around and around and around and around and around and around again we're going around and around and around and around well done suggestion number one million is enjoy the trip enjoy the trip Thank you. Well done. Take a bow. To do the Q&A. If anybody has any questions for me, if you want your flower back, you can come. Get These are so beautiful. Any, uh, just Q&A about anything or nothing or, or any answers. I'll ask the questions. Oh. Oh, yeah, sure, yeah, it's a mic, shoot. Yeah, Hello. oh, there's a mic, oh, sorry. I don't know if these shoot. are for the questions, no. but um, I would love the origin story or hear more about the live stream and watching you work, how that got started. Um, sure. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. And like h how you do it and who you do it with. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. Thank and you. Yeah, sure, watch me work. So uh, those of you who are there this afternoon, you just go blah, 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 like, you know, because I'm going to repeat myself. But about... Ten years ago, I was hanging out with a friend, uh, Jesse Alec, who works at the Public Theater. And Jesse is a producer, writer, performer, and he said, Hey, SLP, um, I'm producing a festival of writers, and we have a lot of work from young writers, and we're really interested in getting a play from an older writer. And I was like, <laughs> actually, I cried later. No, but I, um, I was like, well, I was too busy, of course. So I said, hey, man, I'd love to help out. I'm way too busy. But, and then my mouth opened, and the words started coming out of my mouth, and I was not controlling them. I was just like the channel for these words. I said, but I tell you what I will do. I will put a desk on stage and bring my timer and I will invite, for 20 minutes, I will invite the audience to create uh, action of a play with me. We'll all work together. And then after that, we'll do Q&A about their work, which will be the dialogue of the play. And I'll call it Watch Me Work. 
And I've been doing it in the lobby for 10 years, in the lobby of the public theater. Um, I invite, it's open to everybody, and it's free. I tell people it's just like Shakespeare in the park, except it's not Shakespeare and it's not in the park. Um, but it is free, and we talk about the work of the students, the people who come. So it's not me talking about my work, it's me asking you, like, how's your work going today? Like that, and we'll talk like that. Um, and we live stream on HowlRound, H-O-W-L-R-O-U-N-D, which is a service provided by Emerson. I'm gonna get the college wrong. A co Emerson, I was gonna say Emerson. Who said that? Who knew? Yeah, you know. Oh, pup. Thank you. So we're at Emerson College, and they're awesome there, and they, they host us and allow us to reach lots of people. We have people tweet in from all over the country and all over the world asking, talking. It's a wonderful community. So, yeah, it's fun. It's fun. Yes, hi. Hi. Um, uh, what's the origin of the, um, the walking ritual that you had? Do you, is that from a church thing or just from out of... Um, uh, it's a, any kind of memory that you have? What inspired you to have the whole group get up and do that? Oh, oh, oh well, oh, well th this play was directed by Ware Harmon. It's where, well, I mean, I said, you know, people cross the stage, but, but you had them, like, crossing so beautifully. I mean, what we did, you know, Ware said, hey, come, come and celebrate with us, and maybe you could write a little something. So... I wrote a little something, and I wrote, I wrote it for, for where, and I wrote it for all of you guys, um, and, and all of us, you know. But just, I, I wanted, um, uh, everybody is a part of it, you know, so I wanted everybody to have an experience of just crossing through the light, you know, um, and, being, and just participating as they, as they would like to. It was very moving, though, because I'd never done it, you know, it's experimental theater, you know. It's like, I'd never actually done it. I just wrote it and emailed it to you. <laughs> so. Last week. Yeah, that's right, last week. Um, oh, well, I, I wrote it actually like a month ago, but I was like correcting the typos, um, which take a long time. So that's all. But I never actually experienced it. Experience, it's, it's, it's amazing. I, I wish you guys had been here just to see you beautiful people cross across the stage holding flowers. It was like, whoa. So it was fun. Thanks for joining in. Hey. I want to thank you for allowing me in your circle. This is a surprise for me because I had not planned to come at all. My writing friends insisted that I come to meet you, and I'm honored. Thank you, thank you so much. very much. Thank you so much. That's very kind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about uh, writing your songs? Because I'm a songwriter. Oh, right on. Uh, it's a sometime theater group. And I'm wondering, are your, um, are your songs uh, always birthed from your plays, or do they sometimes come at you just like a, like there were little plays that still. I want to be heard. <laughs> yeah, and, does, and how, long, how long does it take you to, uh, like sometimes I'll write a song in 45 minutes and then it'll take me four and a half years to write one and they're short little things sometimes, but talk to me about your process. I know, I know. you know, well, you know, I mean, cause you, you know, it, those of us with the creative process, sometimes it's fast and sometimes it's not, you know? Um, or like, what is it in, in Gypsy, that musical? You gotta take the rough with the smooth, you know? She's, uh, I'm That's one tying. of the only musicals I really love, by the right, way, it's right. funny. And I, and I was about to say, it says Tyne Daly, which is, it's not <laughs> Tyne Daly, but that's the image I have in my head. Yeah. But, um, she was but, surprisingly good in that. Oh, surprisingly, ouch, ooh. No, I mean, I, I didn't expect it from her, that's all Oh, oh no, you know, yeah, and actor, I only saw it on singer, a you know, yeah. Cagney and Lacey, yeah. But yeah. Are, are your songs always birthed in your plays, yeah, yeah, or yeah. Do, are they sometimes yeah. separate? So, you know, um, a lot of them are, but more and more now that I'm playing out with the band, a lot of them I just write for the band. Oh, I just cool. sit there and, and uh, come up with the groove and, and, uh, and write them that way. So, and it's interesting, my husband Christian was telling me, reminding me the other day, he said, the more you gig with the band, the fewer songs you have in your plays. 
because basically my first thing, the playing the piano, uh, yeah. I'm a musician who... Me, me too. Got, yeah, you, know, you, you, you get in the theater, you know. Um, I got in the theater and love it, but... You know, uh, I think my first love was writing songs. Right. They're, so. like, they're like little plays in a way. Kind, 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 of, kind, or kind, a of, kind of, but sometimes they take it. And that's a test to your practice. Sometimes you write something and it's really quick. Uh, uh, and then sometimes it'll take ages to write something. And it doesn't mean one is better or worse than the other. Do you find yourself writing now that you have a band? Yeah. With them in your head a little bit? Like, oh, so-and-so will be... Would do a great sax solo here or something like yeah, does that. Yeah. Happen? I just, I just, you know, I just like what do we, what do I want to play around with, you know? But I want to sit down, but I wanted to say that I, I, I don't know a lot about your history, but when you stepped out and started talking, I went, oh, she's kind of like the love child of Lily Tomlin and James Baldwin, and then you started talking about Baldwin, I went, oh wow. <laughs> anyway, I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Now that's an interesting love affair. <laughs> it's very funny. Oh, hi. Hi. Sorry, I don't mean to shift the tone here, uh -oh. but um, what are the stories that scare you, and how do you find ways to smile at them? That's a, it's funny that that line, the stories that scare you because that's a, a I mean it, it it's also I've heard a, a suggestion of a prompt from a writer. Uh, she, uh, she says, you know, write, write about what scares you, you know, and I go, oh, I don't know, you know, um, but little stupid things scare me, so I, everything scare, you know, like coming here, talk, I mean, well, it's weird, I, the one fear I don't have is like public speaking, which I hear that people have, you know, I'm a ham, so it's like, no, nah, I can get in front of people and go, la 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 but, um, you know, I think, I think hatred scares me, you know, and trying to get underneath that, you know, and, and trying to smile at people who give you these looks like, ooh, they're angry at me for like no reason, or a reason, but it's not really a reason, you know? And, and tr trying to get through that when you see people who really, like, you know, they don't like you, or you're kind, you know? Um, and trying to just go, I'm gonna keep on keeping on, you know? Um, because, I don't know, we all, no matter what we look like on the surface, we all come from some kind of people who kept on keeping on. So I draw from that, you know, as much as I can, and lean on my friends and my family, you know? Thank you. Good question. We can shift the tone. I can go, you know, SLP can go dark, man. <laughs> Hi. Hi. You mentioned Shakespeare earlier. Yeah. You quoted a little bit from The Tempest. Earlier today, I met someone named Ariel, and I said, full fathom five, my father lies if his bones are coral made. And that song, Ariel's song, really lives in my head. The Tempest lives in my head a lot. I just wanted to sort of open the door to saying anything you felt like about The Tempest or just Shakespeare in general. Well, we are such stuff as dreams are made of. That's kind of the limit to my... Uh, uh, well, I mean, the, the, the thing... I mean, I, I, I love Shakespeare as a writer, you know, um, uh, and I think his writing has taught me, I mean, there are hundreds of writers that I love, of course, it's not to the exclusion of other writers, but his writing has taught me so much about character, dramatic structure, you know, um, how to make a line sing, how to write economically, all those things that we need as, as writers, whether you write plays or not, you know. Um, so I just say, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, it's, it might be kind of pricey to go to a Shakespeare play or you gotta, if you're in New York, wait in line in the park and that, if you don't have a job or I don't know, you know, how you do it. Um, but it's, you can always sort of go to the library and read the plays. Uh, it's just a great way to form, uh, to strengthen your imagination, I think. Thank you. Thank you, thanks. Oh. We have time for these two questions. 
Sorry, I wasn't trying to preempt you. Go ahead. Um, hi, I love your work, um, and I just wanted to ask, okay, I kind of have like a, A, real quick, um, what do you find empowerment in? Empowerment? Empowerment in, like what empowers you? Okay, what's your second question? Oh, my second question was just like, if there was one thing that you could change about like the theater industry and the world that we work in, what would it be? Or just the world that we're working in. Like if... <laughs> you can only answer one if you I want to. I can only to. answer one? No, 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 if you want to. Oh, no. <laughs> it's up to you. You don't have to answer one. No, no. What do I find empowering? Um, I find um, people who are uh, kind, very empowering. To be kind to someone you don't know, you know, right? I mean, to be like kind to, you know, when you go to get your groceries, you're kind to the checkout counter person, you know? Totally. I mean, I mean, sure, we're always like, we gotta be kind to the people who we gotta be kind to, the important people. But when you're just kind to just people, just whomever, right? That I find very, very empowering. That can make my whole week. Yeah. Just someone making some f sweet conversation, you know, like that. That I find very, very empowering. I mean, the, the power of kindness is, uh, we just should always remember that. And if I could change one thing about the, <laughs> you know what it is. I get, <laughs> I'd get a time machine and we'd all go, like the Avengers or whatever that movie was. I'd <laughs> And we'd all go back in time. Yeah. Yeah. And we'd all go vote. Yeah. <laughs> all of us for the right woman. Yeah. And that's just what I'm saying. I'm just not naming any names or anything. I mean, not the wrong woman. The right woman. The woman who's <laughs> smart and was so, is so qualified for the job. Yeah. That a whole bunch of people in this country decided to hate on her. I'm just going to say that. Thank you. So, yeah. Yes. Hi, thanks for being here. Thank you for being here. I also have two questions which might be related, might not. The first is just idle curiosity, but I'll ask them both. Um, yeah, one is that after day like today, do you like curl up in a ball for a week or do you just spring out of bed in the morning tomorrow and do this again. And really, my deeper question is, when you spring out of bed, what is it that kicks your brain into gear and puts you into motion? What is that creative force? The thing you dress like a verb, I'm gonna Kicks your brain into gear that oh. gets you moving, that, that creates what you're doing right here. Sure. That, that is the seed of that. What is it that drives that force? So, um, yeah, so, yeah, so after a day like today, which is not over yet because we have a gig to do tonight, um, what do I do? Do I crawl up and, yeah, I know, um, it's so funny, it's, it's, I know it's a joke. So I'm right now, right now, yeah, right now, but not right at this very moment. I'm the showrunner for a Nat Geo uh, limited series on Aretha Franklin. So on Monday, I'll teach my NYU class in the morning and then go run my writer's room in the afternoon. So that's the day. That's my day. Um, so that's kind of just the thing. That, so what, you know, so to spring out of bed, you know, it's often like, I'm going to be late for my class. <laughs> or my kid, you know, Durham, our son, has, hi, mommy, daddy. You spring out of bed. You know what I mean? So there's no, uh, I, I really work to focus on what's good and things that I can do something about. And the things that I cannot do something about, I really work to just, you know, give love to the people I meet. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Like you guys, because you're beautiful. Thanks. I think, is that the end of the question? On behalf of all of us, thank you for, thank you for traveling all this way across the country to share that healing hug.
And I hope you will stick around at 8 o'clock tonight to hear Susan Laurie and Christian go out on a limb and make music and tie off this big day. Um, can't thank you enough for being with us. And we'll see you all soon. Cool.